Hello, hello, hello. We are about to start. I'm super, super thrilled that in such a short notice we can have the second Printify Tech Talks to bring this time to you Ganon Hall. Uh, he is an amazing person uh, to work with. We have been working the whole last week on strategy and process and cadence and many great product related things at Printify with him. And I'm super glad that we have opportunity to share that knowledge with the Riga community, product people. Uh, how many product related people do we have in the audience? Okay, even more than last time. How many engineers? Perfect, because Ganon by craft is also an engineer. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm very impressed by him, how he became from engineer to uh, such a strong product person. How many founders? Okay, so pretty much the even split. Um, so as, sorry. <gasps> Just too fast. <laughs> so, uh, to introduce Ganon, he has been the VP of product at Shopify. He has been uh, leading teams at Google. He has been the product strategy behind Eventbrite, the application all of you use to sign up for this event. So, not only that, apart from that, he... Uh, Sorry, I'm too fast is this thing. Uh, he's also a musician, see, so he composes music. You can find him on Spotify. Let's all welcome on stage da Ganon. <laughs> Check. Is this thing working? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. Quite a turnout we got here. I'm getting nervous. I'm going to take a picture. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Ganon, you have had an amazing career growth, and like the thing I'm I'm super like impressed about is that uh, you started as an engineer and then you grow, grew into a product uh, manager. Mm -hmm. How did you develop? Like when we worked together with you the past uh, five days, I have been amazed by how much user-centric you are, mm -hmm. which is not always typical for uh, engineers. How do you develop that sense of user-centricity? Um, that came just from experience and, and, and years of, of trying to figure out how to make good products that resonated with markets and people. Um, in terms of going from an engineer to a product manager, the, the truth is that I just wasn't a very good engineer. <laughs> so. Um, you know, you, you kind of, you know, I was... So I was, that's a tip for all <laughs> bad engineers. <laughs> I was, a, I was, you know, at the right place, right time. You know, I was working as a, as a software engineer, um, you know, doing client server applications just before the internet. And um, the internet happened, you know, and I was in, living and working in San Francisco, 1994, you know. Netscape was still in, no, Netscape wasn't even around or was in beta. There was only the CERN web server out of uh, CERN in uh, Switzerland, Tim Berners-Lee, and Andreessen had done the Mosaic browser out of university. Um, so it was very early, but uh, very, very quickly, once Netscape was founded, when they were in beta, especially in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, there was huge demand for people who understood web technology. So I'm a young kid, you know, early 20s, you know, programming at some stupid corporate job. I'm like, fuck, I gotta get out of here. I wish my music career would take off so I could, so I could don't have to do this anymore. Yeah, but the internet was like, just changed everything. It suddenly made uh, things much, much more interesting and afforded a lot more opportunity for creativity uh, within technology. And it just, it just opened up a green field. And being a creative person, um, you know, my parents are both artists and kind of grew up in a very creative environment, but I also was kind of a nerd, like program computers and stuff. So it was just a, it's luck. It's just a confluence of things happened, perfect storm, and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of opportunity to get involved in the early internet happenings in San Francisco. Um, yeah. To put uh, some of the things in, in, in scale, uh, how many, like, can you share, like, how many people were reporting to you, like, how many teams, for example, at uh, Shopify? 
um, um, how many teams? Well, it was the whole product organization, um, which is generally not that big, right? In terms of direct reports, you know, um, if you have like what a- What do you mean by that? Well, if you, have a, if, you have a, if you have a 10 to one ratio of engineer to PM, which is pretty common, um, your reporting chain is much smaller generally than let's say a, a uh, engineering manager, right? Who's got a lot of engineers. So um, the actual direct reports, probably five at Shopify, but they have this n term called span of control. It sounds really ominous, span of control. But what it means is the teams that you're leading with a product manager and a team of engineers um, in aggregate is, is quite large. Um, and uh, you know, for me, that's been a good thing because the, the kind of the unit for me of actually getting stuff done and shipping software and making it happen are teams in those squads that, that actually do the work. So, um, you know, how many people report to me was never kind of a, something I, I aspire to. I need a bigger team. It was, I just want a better team or I want more engineers. How do I get more engineers to work on my projects, right? That's the, that's the kind of, uh, at least for me, it's been a recurring theme in my career as a PM is how do I convince engineers to work on this project, right? If you're at a bigger company like Google or something like that, Google works in an interesting way in that you don't, you don't kind of join the company and they're like, here's your project and here's your resources. You, you kind of have to um, uh, create demand internally for what you're doing, right? You have to create a vision that gets engineers excited and you've got to you know, work with engineers as, as kind of equal partners. And I think it helped a lot having that engineering background um, to be able to relate to and, 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 and work with them. And I think that has had a lot to do with, um, I mean, has been a, had a big impact on the things that I did, you know, because I didn't really do them. My teams did them. Um, so I certainly can't take credit for a lot of this stuff. But, you know, I was afforded the opportunity to work with these amazing engineers, you know. Talking about taking credit, what, what's your proudest moment? Um, boy, that's, that's a tough one. It's changed a lot throughout my career. So if you were, were to ask me this 10 years ago, it probably would have been shipping, you know, some cool app or feature that was got, you know, a great, you know, press coverage and tons of usage. Um, but over time, it has become uh, much more related to uh, working with teams and seeing them thrive and succeed and learn the craft of product and, and um, you know, make good decisions, do what's right for users and build great products. And that's, today, that's what I find most gratifying and that's why I'm, doing, that's why I'm working with you guys and doing consulting work because I really like working with people and kind of trying to, uh, I guess, um, communicate the knowledge that I've have been so fortunate to receive and um, in the hopes that uh, that will be of value to you and, and others, you know? How do you like, looking at just how you work, I, I, I see that you invest an in insane amount of time into like developing the product and you really care about it. How do you find time uh, to combine that with also cr the creative output of creating music on the time because Danny on the other time was telling me that you're just like crazy creating <laughs> songs every day, right? Yeah, sometimes D Daniel said the other day, he said, you know, not everybody moves at 160 miles an hour, <laughs> you know, because I, I had made some comment, not, not, not regarding you guys. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, some people, um, I think, uh, need to be making things all the time. And at least that's what I think my thing is. Um, I, I just, I, I don't, you know, I, I read a lot, so I do consume a lot of stuff and I I'm, you know, love cinema and everything, but I, I really don't feel okay until I make something. And that could be writing a blog post. That could be, you know, the stuff that we're working on together. You know, uh, that could be doing a deck for, for this talk or something, but I just feel a need to create all the time. And music, uh, for a long time, I didn't work on it. So when I, I had a music career in my late teens, early 20s, and then I was like, I need a real job. <laughs> I got to be able to pay the rent. Um, so I kind of turned my back on that for like 20 years, you know. And then it's only five years ago that I got back into it. And 
that's what I do in the evenings, you know? I go, you know, you just gotta make time for it. Gotta make time for your passions, you know? That's just the bottom line. Um, as a product manager, you have to make decisions all the time, and some of these decisions are hard, and fuck-ups do happen, so, uh, so we can better connect with you. Can you share what's your biggest fuck-up? Oh, uh, there's just so many, I don't know where to start. <laughs> Um, my biggest fuck up, oh boy. Um, I don't think I can say it actually. I don't think it's safe, it's not safe for, uh, for um, extradition or something on criminal charges, just kidding. Um, no, it would, it would probably be, um, I think the biggest mistake I, I made um, in the beginning of my career was developing a lot of hubris, you know what hubris is? arrogance um, that I knew the answer to things um, because I had a track record of some successes and you kind of, when that happens, you kind of think, you know, I'm, you know, I know what's up. And the reality is that you don't. And I think that there was a time where that kind of sent me on a little bit of a wrong course in my own development as a human being and as a, you know, professionally. And uh, it, it, the, I needed to experience some serious failures, you know, some serious mistakes. And I don't want to speak to them because I don't want to call out any companies or anything. Um, but yeah, uh, mistakes about us making assumptions about how users would, would respond to something that I thought, this is awesome, everyone's going to love this, and then realizing that nobody loves it, um, and that I didn't have the answers. And, and for me, that experience, the, as painful as it is, and as humbling as it is, ultimately, I think, put me on a path to r r really becoming interested in what is the craft of product management? Like, what is my job? Like, how am I supposed to think about these problems? And how can I, uh, how, what kind of actions can I take? What kind of culture can I create so that the outcomes are as positive as possible? And what I learned was ultimately that was humble, be humble, um, recognize that you don't have the answers and the answers need to come from actual users and from real data, empirical evidence, and um, your colleagues, and, and kind of, in a way, it's, it's, it's becoming mature enough or experienced enough to say, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I can figure it out and I can get the right answers if I'm you know, thoughtful and I listen and I'm open to other points of view. And so ultimately, I think that, that put me in, a, in, a, in the right path, having that, those kind of failures, so. So now you feel more comfortable saying you don't know things. I don't know. I mean, you know, or, or here's one way to do it that might work, yeah. that worked for me a couple times, but let's, please, let's challenge this stuff. You know, the stuff I'm gonna talk about today, it's like, let's challenge it. I mean, it's. So in a few minutes, Daniel, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gannon will uh, do the presentation and then at, at the end uh, you guys can ask a bunch of questions. Uh, he promised to answer them all, I heard. Um, before the, we were coming here, I asked Gannon, so is, is there any restrictions that I can't ask? And he's like, um, you can ask me anything. Oh, shh. <laughs> so, uh, that was my biggest mistake. <laughs> so uh, I thought, okay, I, I will do that. So question number one. Should marijuana be decriminalized in Latvia? Yes, absolutely. No question. <laughs> question number two. What's the craziest thing you have done as a musician? Oh, no, no. I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Mm -mm. Um, question number... <laughs> uh, yeah, we, I, well, okay. I can imagine. All right. I have one story. Okay. Very short story. Um, early on in my music career when, you know, we're... we're kind of had our first record, we signed a record deal, but we're, we're driving our own motor home with a trailer on the back with all, all of our music equipment, and we had no road crew, right? But we were, we were touring all over the United States, so we would take turns driving, right? And it's the dead of winter, and we're in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin, United States is, is I'm sure it's, you guys experience this in the winter, but it's very cold, uh, a lot of black ice on the, on the roads. We're California kids. We didn't even, hadn't even seen ice before. And we're trading driving duties. However, we got really sick. And I think a lot of us got pneumonia. Like, so we play a show and it's like, oh, just go to bed. And I played a show and I drank some NyQuil 
You guys know what the NyQuil is? It's a, it's a cough medicine, but it's, it's a cough medicine and a sedative to put you to sleep so you can sleep. And if you stay up on it, it's kind of like, it's, it's trippy. Let's just say that. <laughs> okay. So um, anyway, I'm, a, I'm asleep in my bunk and our singer, Scott, says, wake up, man. And I said, oh, what? what? He said, it's your turn to drive tonight, dummy. I said, no, no, I took a bunch of NyQuil. And he's like, no, you're driving. Everyone has to do it. So I said, fine, I'm going to drive. So I'm driving the, you know, Winnebago, the, the camper with our equipment, a big trailer on black ice. It's snowing. I'm getting tunnel vision. I can't see. And I remember um, a curb coming in the road and I tried to turn and the, 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 um, it just didn't turn. It just kept going. And I went down the embankment off the freeway and Scott, Scott who was co-piloting, so we had to have a co-pilot, Although he was stoned off his ass, so I don't know what, how he managed to, to figure this out. But um, he said, uh, gun it, gun it, you know, just gun it. And he was right. And I just, so I hit the gas and went up the embankment, over the other side, onto the freeway, going the other way, and slid to a stop and everything was fine. Uh, so that was the crazy story. Oh, wow, that's a crazy story. Yeah, I'm indeed. sweating just talking about it. <laughs> Question number three, um, and I will draw some parallels here. So. Steve Jobs was come from California. You are from California. Steve Jobs liked music. You liked music a lot. Steve Jobs was really good at product. You are very good at product. Steve Jobs said that one of the best things he had done in his life was dropping acid and that it changed his life. So my question is like, have you tried it and how did it have a, like any positive impact on your career? Where's this video going? <laughs> Is it? Yeah, it's public. I don't care. Yes, I've taken LSD. Yes, it had a profound impact on how I see things. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like pro in No, I am not <laughs> condoning illicit drug use. Um, I think that uh, I think that's you know. Uh, let me answer this seriously because I think it is it is a good question. I think the reason why because the reason I ask because when you read the book, it, like you can right. get mis interpretations so. right so I so saw my my interpretation of you know Steve Jobs comes from a different gen the generation kind of between my parents and me um, and my parents certainly came out of the 60s generation right and and uh, I think for a lot of people uh, in California after the late 60s and the 70s um, there was a very uh, there was a desire to kind of break out of the mental models and the ways of thinking. And as you know, Steve Jobs, you know, really wanted to innovate and kind of had an, uh, you know, he's one of the greatest innovators of, of our time. Um, and I think for him and a lot of other people, Timothy Leary and, and Albert, uh, whatever his name was, Richard Alpert uh, at Harvard University, you know, we're, we're, have found this substance, like a lot of other psychedelics, was like, wow, this is a, this is a gateway Aldous Hux, Huxley called it, um, what was his book? Uh, oh God, was the Aldous Huxley book on psychedelics? Um, Doors of Perception, yep, yep. So, so I, think, I think that provided for a lot of those people a mechanism to kind of get out of status quo thinking, which is very much about innovation you know, today, and to think in ways that you don't normally think because it rewires your brain a little bit and you kind of see things differently, whether it's, you know, spiritual or whatever, I don't know, but it definitely makes you see the world differently and you can see different perspectives. And Steve Jobs, absolutely, from my understanding, would ask in interview questions, have you taken LSD? And if you said no, you, he, he would not hire you because he thought that that was the only path. Since that period, I think a lot of people, myself included, have uh, found other ways, other ways to achieve that same type of um, innovative thinking. And some of it is, is just based on some of the, I mean, we've talked about a lot of this stuff this week and kind of like, you know, I would challenge you guys, like, how do we rephrase this to be about the user problem? Like, how do we kind of frame these problems? And then how do we think about these problems through a technological lens? Or how do we think about these problems forgetting everything we know about how this should be done? That's how you innovate. So meditation, you know, taking long walks, um, even, even, just, even just really tactical methods like um, you know, looking at the problem set. What's the problem? I don't know, people need to swipe credit cards to buy something in a store. 
and then, and then saying, okay, forget there was POS systems, forget there was cash registers for salespeople. Is it possible to solve that problem with today's technology? And if you think that way, I mean, I'm sure everyone in this room, in that little thing I just thought of, can think of a few ways that that could probably be solved. And that type of mental model for innovating, uh, you don't need to take psychedelics to get there. And so. Last question for me, not, not a crazy one. Um, no uh, more when, drug references. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, when we were talking, you said, when you traveled to New York, you were like, oh my God, you guys are five years behind San Francisco in terms of product development discipline. And then you visited Berlin and you were like, oh my God, you guys are five more years behind New York. I didn't say it that way. But like, <laughs> sort of that, okay. that, that way. And uh, then like Latvia, I'm sure like we are lacking behind uh, Berlin. So could you like for the people here describe like the major dis differences that you see uh, in the product development discipline, the craft of it. Um. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of, um, I think there's, with, with product management, um, there are so, it's a discipline that's, that's very broad. You have to be skilled in communication, in kind of uh, innovation, in execution, right and left brain, and many times you have to be the glue that binds these disparate functional units in the company, marketing and sales, the executive team. Um, you have to get people motivated and on board. And I just think, I, th I think this is, just has to do with the amount of time that people have been building technology products in that part of the world, in Silicon Valley. It's been a lot longer than the rest of the world. So because of that, the discipline of product management has become more, um, it's just a little bit further along and with all, just because a lot of people are thinking about it and kind of working on it. You know, Google has an amazing program called the APM program where uh, young, young people are hired into the company straight out of university and he's spending the first two years essentially going to kind of like a graduate school of product management. And I, you know, uh, Marissa Mayer is largely, should be credited for building this program. Um, and when I was at Google, I was just struck by how incredibly well-versed everyone who went through this program was in every aspect of product management with variant testing and go-to-market strategies and and they all kind of spoke the same language used the same vernacular and were all contributing to the ongoing evolution of this craft and um, you just don't have that in many other places so again I, I think it's just having done it for a longer period of time parts of the world are going to be further along and especially with something like product management with which a lot of people don't totally understand right so um, you go to one place and they say oh yeah here's the here's the PM for this product right and you talk to them and, and, and you know they, they they could be extremely smart very capable person and get stuff done but um, has, has, has just maybe not considered some of these other things that we take for granted in many cases having done it for so long. But to be honest, you know, um, there is no right way to do it, <laughs> right way to do product management. And I've, I've met some incredibly talented and worked with some incredibly talented product managers that do things very differently than I do. And that it works for them. And uh, what I do works for me. And I think, again, this comes back to humility. It comes back to when I meet a young PM, maybe straight out of college, and is looking at how to do product management differently, right? Because they don't have status quo thinking. You know, I think, because I've been doing it for so long, this is the way you do it. Like the first time someone is faced with how do I put a roadmap together, and they don't have a textbook to go by, they're gonna make something up. And maybe they make something up that's better than what you've been doing. And if you're not, if you're not able to be open to that and to learn constantly, learn from everybody, then you're just gonna be, become stagnant, you know? And so, you know, I, I, would, I, would, I would just also say that, you know, what always strikes me when I leave San Francisco and Silicon Valley and come to Europe and stuff like that is I'm reminded that, that San Francisco is not the center of the universe, that there's a lot of really interesting things happening all over the world by a lot of interesting companies and, um, you know, I learn as much from these types of trips as you guys do from what I bring to the table in, in a whole different ways. I know it sounds, 
like I'm being humble, but it's genuinely true. Well, I'm glad to hear that, and I'm very glad that you have visited us here to share that knowledge that you have gained on the other side of the ocean. So I will give this remote control right. for you. Uh, I think you have to point it that way uh, so that it work, uh, would work. Which is forward? And All right, cool. Mr. Gannon, All right. this is yours. So um, product market fit. Does everyone know what that word means? It's kind of a jargony word. Yes. What is it? Oh. Come on. <laughs> when your, um, your product has find a good fit in the market, and you actually start making sense to users, right. and they start using it. That's right. Generate revenue. Yes, you generate revenue, or generate users, or whatever your, your strategy is. What she said is that it's about creating a product that fits a market so that you can have users and demand for that product and generate revenue and have a real business. Um, that's exactly right. You know what a go-to-market strategy is? I bet you do. <laughs> Anyone? Go-to-market strategy? Uh, part of this is, is just me understanding what you do and don't know in terms of semantics and kind of business speak stuff. So a go-to-market strategy is, you know, specifies how you're going to go to market and reach your customers, commercialize your offering, and ultimately achieve some type of success, whether that's market leading success or however you gauge success. Um, and determining a product market fit strategy is really the first step in your go to market strategy, right? So if you have an idea, you have a product idea, you've put together a startup, um, you need to figure out how are we gonna take this thing that we've built to market, and that is critical in successfully you know, building products. So determining how product market fit works is the, really the first step, because if you don't understand how your product's gonna work in a certain market or whether or not there's demand for it, you don't have a go-to-market strategy. There's no market. So how can you have a, how can you go to the market if there's no market for your product? So when, we, when I think about this stuff, um, you know, how do you, what is the process that one can take to increase the probability of success in going to market, right? In, in, in bringing a new product to market, in reaching product market fit. And this is a word that we talk about all the time with startups. You know, has, how they, have they achieved product and market fit? Yes or no. How are we going to achieve product market fit? And one thing that I noticed, kind of doing this time and time again, is that I realized that we were thinking about it backwards. What we were doing oftentimes is coming up with a cool product idea that we got super excited about, and then trying to figure out where do we, what market do we bring this to that's going to had the biggest demand for the product that we're building, right? And you know, it occurred to me, and I'm sure it's occurred to a lot of other people, that actually the better way to think about this is starting with the market and understanding who's the market, what's the market, what's our value proposition to this market, and then having that drive the product. Okay, what is the product going to be? You may have a, an idea like Printify, which is you know, on-demand printing, but that's just the idea, right? From the idea, it needs to kind of evolve into a full-blown strategy that resonates with a certain market, that resonates, it meets a need of one kind or another. So the way I look at this in terms of a sequence, a process, a guide that anyone can follow, the first thing you wanna do is identify who your customer is, who your user is. You need to determine what are the needs that have not been met for this user, and just list them out. Okay, the current solutions in the marketplace don't do this, 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 and we know that they need this, this, and this. Define what the value proposition is, and I'll talk about what this stuff is in more detail. Identify what are the key features that you need to, to make an MVP to bring to market, and then develop and test the user experience. So those are kind of the steps that I tend to follow, and it's broken up. The top of it is product, the bottom of it is market. But what's important is to start from the bottom up. Figure out the market first, or at least have a pretty good sense of how the market works before 
you kind of build your product. So starting with the market, market first. So this is a good quote, speaking of Steve Jobs. I don't think he wrote this while he was on LSD, but he may have. Um, but I think the, the, the key takeaway is super important. Um, focus, focus is probably the most important thing that a technology startup can do. Um, in those endeavors that I've done that have been failures, it's because we lacked focus. We try to do two thing, too many things at once. Um, the ones that were successful were in every single case due to the fact that we were laser focused on one problem, one type of user in one market, and we said no to everything else, right? That's what Steve says. People think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred good ideas that, are, that, that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things that I've done. Innovation is saying no to 1,000 things. And that's so true in practice. Um, and if you, you know, everyone here is working in this field and you all know what it's like, you know, you build something cool, your board has ideas, everyone's got ideas, new opportunities come, people wanna have meetings with you to partner. Oh yeah, we should do a partnership deal and you can go into this market and that market and it's overwhelming. And you get super excited about these opportunities and these business development deals and you end up just spread super thin and just kind of following every little thread and you're not focused. And that, that, that results in a product that has no product market fit, right? Because you haven't, you don't ha you haven't uh, taken the disciplined steps to create something very specific for a very specific type of user. And I'll talk about more about that in a moment. So what I think is a good approach to this, and you know, please stop and challenge these ideas, um, is to define one persona, right? And I'm speaking in the context of a early stage startup. Right? I'm not speaking like Microsoft, I'm not talking about Google, I'm talking about an early stage startup. Define one persona. The only path to success that I've seen is a really focused and sequential market strategy. If you try to be everything to everyone, you end up being nothing to no one, right? So by, by being hyper-focused on one user with a set of needs, you can put a lot more resources behind fewer needs than if you were to try and go after, let's say, four different types of users in four different verticals in four different geographic regions. That's extremely difficult to do. So focus, focus, focus. Any questions, comments? All right. Okay, so if you've got this one user to find, um, how do you figure out what their actual needs are, right? How do you determine what needs that you're going to deliver solutions for? Some of the, uh, tactics, that I, the tactics that I've used are you know, quantitative data analysis. Is there data available about this type of a user? Um, whether that's through research reports, through your own kind of online research, through existing products, you have access to their behavioral data. Um, there's qualitative surveys and user studies. That, for early stage startups, I think is probably the best method of gathering and understanding what the user problems and needs are. And that just means, you know, talking to, you've identified who your user is. Let's just say for the sake of argument, um, it is uh, fashion shoppers who are millennials with an income over $100,000 that live in the United States in major metropolitan areas. Let's just say it's that. Um, well, you, you can go talk to them. Like you can identify these people and uh, ask them questions and, and just get very close to them very early so that you can start to understand how they think and what's important to them. As I was saying earlier when we were talking, I don't know, right? And any product manager worth the salt is not going to say, yeah, I know what they need, this is what they need. And Steve Jobs never said, I know what they need, this is what they need, despite the myth that he did. Um, so it, it's, it's really a matter of getting with these people and understanding what it is that, that is important to them. And invariably, the answers are gonna surprise you, right? And those answers are gonna drive your product strategy, ultimately. You know, um, I did work, I have worked on a couple of products that, that have that exact persona I just described, and um, 
you know, it's fascinating learning just from a kind of a, a, a sociological, sociological standpoint, um, you know, what these people are like and what their needs are and how their thinking differs from your own about making decisions, what their mental modalities are. It's really kind of interesting stuff. And if you look at it and go about it in a more of a scientific research approach, it's going to really inform the, your three-year vision, where you think this thing is going, and it's going to increase the probability that you're going to create the right features and the right product to meet their needs. Market research, right? Super common, whether that's coming from product marketing, you hire a research firm, you just buy some reports, you know, get an understanding of how big is this market, right? Um, how is it growing? What are the trends? Um, what's happening? There's tons of information available for free. Um, and then you can always buy stuff. It's out there if you look for it. This informal discussions. Again, talking to the users, talking to your colleagues, talking to engineers, talking to marketing folks. Get as much information as you can as you start to formulate an understanding of, of what their needs are and how you can address them. Um, and heuristics is the last thing. Um, and that's, that's one that you need to be careful about because you can make a lot of bad decisions if you rely solely on your intuition, right? There's a myth that good product managers have some like product magic, right? That there's some special crystal ball that's there. There isn't a crystal ball. It's, it's just, it's toil. <laughs> it's just working hard, gathering as much data, analyzing that data, and trying to get some evidence that your hypothesis actually is going to resonate and make sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right, so this is an interesting concept that I think is important to convey. Um, so I started, when I started thinking about um, this stuff and, and working through this and doing it a few times, it occurred to me that in order to, that there, there's really kind of two types of products out there, or there's two types of ways to think about user problems and user needs. The first is what I call unmet needs, right? Unmet needs are those things that current solutions in the market are not properly addressing, right? And um, one can go about gathering those by just talking to users. Let's say you're making a new email client, right? And because you realize that Gmail and Outlook and whatever don't do these things that they should and that email is a total pain, which it is. So, um, you come up with a new email client. You are creating a product that's really about addressing unmet needs for the most part. Now, the problem with that, if you do that alone, is that you're likely not going to innovate, right? Because you are simply listening to what users say they want and then giving it to them. You know, we want the ability to do X. Okay, we can do that. We want the ability to do Y. Okay, we'll do that. And instead, Another way to look at it is to think about unrealized needs. What unrealized needs are, are those things that users don't know they want because they've never thought about it before. And it may solve a problem or meet a need of theirs that they didn't know they had. But once they realize it, they're never going to go back. I mean, imagine there was a, there was a time <laughs> before smartphones, right? It's hard to think about what life must have been like without access to the internet on your, all the time or having maps to like navigate around the world, but that's the way it was. Suddenly there's a smartphone out there and it changes the world. There was nobody out there. Nobody went out there and did a consumer study and said, okay, uh, you know, what should we do with our next phone? And everyone said, you should create a touch interface with icons and an app store. And no, that's not at all what happened. What happened was some very enterprising folks in an evolutionary way um, started to address this and recognize that, wow, you know, no one's asking for email in their pocket, but if we gave it to them with a the little keyboard, RIM, you know, the Blackberry, then that might be kind of a cool thing, and it was. And then, you know, Apple did iPhone, Android happens, and people just kind of riff on what others have done and make it a little bit better. And that's about, realizing, you know, that's about addressing unrealized needs. And ultimately, that's the path to innovation and leapfrogging the industry, creating new industries, changing the way people do things, changing the way people operate in the world. It's the way to go really big. I think it's important to, to, to acknowledge, though, that, that you, I believe you have to do both to do a product well. 
you have to you have to be sympathetic and understand what people's needs are as they express them while also taking from what they're saying which is i need x y and z they're giving you solutions and trying to reframe that what they're asking for as a problem all right if they're asking for these three features what is the problem that they're trying to solve by that okay now i understand what the problem is now i can consider the problem in an entirely new way right what 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 exists in technology today that can solve that problem uh, better than anyone else let's take printify for example right so on-demand printing um, this you know no one no one i think is asking for that or asked for that out of the door but the ability to kind of create merchandise sell it online extremely easily without taking on the capital costs of buying tons of inventory um, and having it be high quality and having all the fulfillment done for you is a remarkable thing and it opens up a lot of opportunities right and that ultimately what they did is address an unrealized need right by creating this everyone's like yeah duh why would i not use this to create merchandise it just makes much more sense So this is another way to look at it, to get in a little bit more detail. So meeting unmet user needs, it's delivering you what users what they want, what they're asking for. It's about iterative improvements on what has already been done. So it's kind of building a better mousetrap. Uh, it mitigates risk. It's kind of a, a fairly easy path forward. You can use a lot of user data to drive uh, decisions about what to do. Um, Opportunities are much easier to spot because you just ask people, what do you want? What do you want in the next BMW series? Oh, I really wish you guys had more tweeters in your stereo. Okay, we'll put them in. Great, done. Growth tends to be more slow and steady. So it's, you know, you can kind of build a company up slowly and, and that works. And there's a, there's a ton of great companies that have been built just with the left side of this slide. Um, and as I said before, these are user inspired, right? It's about getting information from users and addressing it. On the right side, unrealized user needs solves a latent problem, a problem that's it's not active, but it exists. Um, it tends to be greenfield bets, which means that you're making a big bet in an area that does not exist because the industry doesn't exist yet. Um, high risk, high reward. Uh, to be thinking like this, you kind of have to disregard the status quo. If you're working in an industry, let's say, um, let's say financial services, you know, FinTech as they call it. Um, if, you're, if everyone that's surrounding you is from the financial services industry, you're gonna have a real hard time identifying and innovating, right? Because everybody around you says, no, that's not the way you do it. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, no, 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 this is how we did it at Bank of America. You can't do that, you can't do this. So you, you need people that are capable of just disregarding how it was done and trying to think of new ways to do it that no one else has done. It requires fresh thinking and it can create new markets and ultimately it's, I think it's technology inspired, right? Um, if you, you uncover these latent user needs, you have to disregard the table stakes uh, and focus on problems through the creative lens of technology. Does that make sense? Questions? All right. Okay, so now we talked about the market pieces, right? We talked about the user. We talked about the user needs. We talked about different ways to get, gather the user needs, the value proposition. So now we get into the product. So defining a value proposition. So I think of it in terms of the what, the who, and the how, right? So a value proposition is what is the product service we're going to build? We know what their problems are. So what project are we gonna to build to address those? Who is this for? We defined that before. We need to articulate that. The user with a significant need for the product or the industry with a significant need for the product. If you take a vertical approach in terms of going to market, say you build a product and wow, it seems like the financial services industry or the automotive industry or retail or e-commerce is perfectly suited for this and the user is a business user, um, and it just becomes abundantly clear through uh, research, through evidence that they have the biggest need for what you're building. And then the how, 
what is, what's the business model? What are the unit economics? What's the pricing model? How can this become profitable over time? Um, how do we deliver this? What's the market strategy? How do we create growth? All those things kind of define the components of the value proposition. So in, in kind of figuring this out, there's three questions that, that, that I think really help in thinking through this stuff. The first is ask yourself, how will your product address customer needs better than any alternative out there, right? Challenge yourself and be honest with yourself. Have you really come up with a solution that is better than anything else out there? Um, and it may, not, it may be better in just one way or two ways, that's okay then acknowledge that and double down on that and make that core to your value proposition, right? Core to what you're offering the market. You know, we are Amazon. Amazon's user interface, uh, you know, it's gotten better, I guess, but it's still, uh. the fact is the stuff gets here. I know you guys don't have it here, but you know all about it, I'm sure. The stuff gets here in an insane amount of time, like literally sometimes the same day. So they nailed one thing, which is, the delivery you know, fulfillment and just killed it. And that changed, they pretty much own commodity e-commerce because of it, at least in the United States. Um, out of all the potential customer needs that the product could address, right, which ones matter most? And this is super important because if you don't do this, you can end up doing what I talked about earlier, which is trying to address everything at once. Oh, the MVP, the minimum viable product, there's a laundry list of features. No, you're never gonna, it's gonna take you forever to build those features and they're gonna be super buggy because you don't have enough engineers to make sure each one is good. The PMs are like, you know, trying to do QA at the last minute, didn't even know about a feature that an engineer snuck in there. It's just not gonna work ultimately. Um, and the third one to ask yourself is, uh, which will have the biggest impact and take the least amount of time and effort to produce? So it's a matter of, a balance of, okay, what, what's the, you know, out of all these customer needs that we've identified, which ones um, that we could address, which ones matter the most, and then of those, which ones can we do in a reasonable amount of time? What's not super hard that's going to take a year to develop? Which ones can we do with a team of five engineers and a product manager and a product designer to get something out the door quickly? And the reason why you want to get stuff out the door quickly is um, you want to get user feedback as soon as possible, right? You want to get stuff in front of real users very, very quickly. That's the only way you're going to be able to gather the data to make informed data-based decisions, right? You need to get it in front of users. You may have done a ton of studies, you may have read a bunch of research, and, but it's not until you get this stuff in front of people that you really get the feedback that's going to um, help you to iterate towards product market fit and a really amazing product. Question. Yes. Uh, yeah. So kind of about that, how do you know or, or how do you, if you're your experience uh, being a part of this role, weigh then the trade-off of getting something to market quick enough because you believe that feedback is super important versus there's always the risk that your engineers are going to Something that you're going to have to scratch. Right. So. No, that's, a, it's a, it, that's a really good question. Um, and and where, do you, where do you kind of, what, what means, you know, does everyone know the term MVP? Right, right. Okay, so viable, right? And there's always, I, I've had so many arguments over, no, this is not viable. <laughs> it's viable, MVP, not like kind of almost viable. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the way to do it is to, that's why you want to limit your scope. That's why you want to have one user, you want to deliver one product that really nails what that user's needs are because then you've reduced your scope and you can put more wood behind fewer arrows, I like to say, which means you can take all of your limited resources and aim it towards that problem. And this isn't just in software. I mean, I, I challenge anyone to come up with a successful company that came to market with a whole bunch of products at once. Uh, Chanel, you know, fashion brand. Coco Chanel came to market with one hat for one type of woman. Very specific. And, you know, Microsoft came up with one operating system 
for one type of personal computer, DOS, right? Apple came out with a super geeky, uh, you know, homebrew, hobbyist computer with the Apple One, right? So that, that to me, it's, it comes back to focus. If you focus and you limit your scope and you, you focus on what they need, then you can do both. You can actually bring to market something pretty awesome that addresses a very specific need without you know, doing too much. A good example is like, I don't know, Slack. Did you ever, anyone use Slack? Okay, Slack has taken over the world. And honestly, if I was an investor and a guy came in and said, I've got a great idea for a new company, it's gonna be group messaging. I'd be like, dude, that's already been done like a million times, right? But these guys really focused in on certain problems with group communication and just nailed just those problems and brought it to market in a very clever way by making it free so that everyone just started using it in work groups. They didn't have to have any salespeople. And then eventually IT is like, oh, we have to get an enterprise license in order to lock down security. That was their strategy. That's, that's a good example of you know, something that was pretty limited in its functionality, but was super valuable to people once they saw it, right? Um, unlike, what are you guys using at Printify? Never mind. Um, let's, no, I won't, I, won't, I won't slam them publicly. Uh, okay, so the three components uh, to a differentiated market position, you know, I like to try and keep these ideas front and center. Um, and it, it, you know, I think it comes down to these many often, and sometimes not, but value, right? What value are you delivering? If you can deliver more value than anyone else, that's super key. Service, and people uh, often forget about this, that the user experience is a lot more than what happens in the pixels. If you're building anything that has a physical component to it, if you're in e-commerce, you're doing hardware, if you're doing like a um, Uber type thing or a grocery delivery service, the experience is mostly about that. It's mostly about you know, the person coming to your door with the groceries, are they on time? Did they get the right stuff, right? Um, did the bag break when you pulled it? It's about all of that. So service is like a really key component to, at least for me, to having a differentiated market position because if you can do service better than anyone else, that's a big differentiator right there. Convenience, right? Making things, I think oftentimes when I look at some failed startups that seem to have a really cool product, I got downloaded from the outside. This is awesome. It looks amazing. It's beautifully designed. Do I need it though? Like, what what utility does this provide to me? Um, and if it doesn't provide that, it might seem cool, but it's not going to it's not going to take off. So convenience, like personalization. These are examples. Subscriptions, easy returns, fast shipping. These are all convenience features that I think often go underlooked. Instead. Oftentimes, we just focus on the cool features, like the shiny features or the cool technology. That's super important, but if you can, if you can win in one or more of these, that gives you a huge advantage. All right, so now that you know, we understand the, uh, the market, we understand the user, we've defined our value proposition, we've even you know, enumerated what some of the needs are, what the problems are, it's time to come up with some potential solutions, right? So this is where you move from the problem space, which is, you know, what is the problem or need that we're trying to solve to how are we gonna actually solve this problem? What are the solutions? And um, the, the approach that I tend to take is, you know, to create ideations of potential solutions, right? With the full acknowledgement that I don't really know which of these is going to work. And I'm not going to know until I do some user testing until I do some focus groups, until I build a prototype. And with each stage, you gather more information that informs the decisions that you're making. Um, and you get closer to feeling like, wow, this I think is gonna work. Several times during that ideation process, you may realize, oh, it's not going to work, actually, because there's some dynamic in the market that means we can't actually do what we wanna do. Regulatory issues, uh, some kind of monopoly dynamic, that you, what you thought was gonna be your channel to reaching users is not gonna be a channel. So when that happens, please. Would you suggest uh, to um, do user testing 
you know, like customer and other customer discovery with just questions, showing no product, not telling anything that we're willing, or uh, alternatively, if you have a couple of hypotheses based on some basis of information about your customer, and then go to the customer showing some screens and yep. asking what works best. The latter, I would say what you, the, the former, the first thing you said is earlier in the process. It's, that's when you're, you're trying to understand the user and trying to understand their needs. And that is a lot of just back and forth talking, no screens, just, you know, how do you use your toothbrush? How many times do you brush your teeth? What do you not like about your toothbrush? What do you not like about, you know, finding a babysitter? Or whatever, whatever it is that you have an idea about that you think your company or your product is going to be about is starting to investigate. It's discovery, right? Just discovering what those things are. At this stage, yes. It can, be, it can start out with just paper prototypes or just like static mocks, functional mocks, and then it keeps evolving to a functional prototype with maybe fake data, and then a functional prototype with real data, and then a you know, non-scalable functional product. That's your MVP, right? You're not worrying about scale because you haven't proven that you need to scale. You haven't proven yet that it's gonna be demand. So why waste time trying to make it scale when you're, you're probably not gonna have more than 10 users to start out with. But those 10 users are gonna give you a ton of input, right? So in the idea, ideation phase, um, ideally you are coming up with multiple potential solutions to this problem, right? That you can start to test. And even, I mean, I would even say part of this testing is just r going through the process of writing out your idea, you know, write, write, Get your thinking tight. Get it very focused. You know, be able to articulate the user journey. Be able to articulate the value proposition. You're basically trying to convince yourself and your colleagues that this is maybe something that we want to invest in. So the first kind of phase of input, frankly, is from the people you work with. You know, I would write, I write ideation, you know, ideas and send it around. Hey, what do you guys think? Yeah. What if they don't provide you with the correct information? You know, when you ask them a question, yeah. would you like to have something? Yeah. They say, yeah, it would be cool. Yeah. And then when you make it, they're like, nah, thank you. That happens. That happens. Um, so how do you rely on them? You, you, you don't... A question. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> that helps. Yeah, the idea tell you. Having, so having good user experience researcher, to your point, is really important. And someone that understands how to phrase this stuff so you're not leading the witness. You know what I mean? You're not kind of putting words in their mouth. I have definitely seen the results of user experience studies that are, have been gamed. Basically, it's led by a PM who just desperately wants their feature to be built the way that they want. And you can just tell, like, wait a minute. Um, you ask a question, do you like Google Maps? But in the ad to get the people for this survey, you said, come hang out with the Google Maps team or something like this. You're gonna, your fanboys are gonna come, right? Oh, and we're gonna give you free Google hats and stuff. So the audience is already gonna be biased. And yet that's the stuff you have to look out for. You're absolutely right. So I think part of it's just being aware of that and, and challenging how do we get this data, exactly what questions were asked, what kind of ads were put out there, testing for cognitive bias. Right? Did, we, did we inject cognitive bias into this supposedly scientific study, right, and getting invalid data back. That, that's super key. But there's no guarantees, right? And that's why I say you really don't know until the product is in their hands. So it, it, the product's not in their hands yet. We're just trying to get as much, as much confidence as we can that we're on the right track, right? It's not guaranteed, right, until it's out there. And even then it's not guaranteed. Let's say it's out there and you've got all this traction, then another competitor comes in and just blows you away can happen, right? Um, any other questions about this? This is really the process of, um, you know, I think what's, what's the important thing to understand is that I'm a big believer in, that especially for product managers, is becoming a good writer and being able to articulate things well, concisely, because you need to convince yourself or, 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 or not convince yourself, but you need to come to some conclusions that you can honestly say, wow, like I really think there's something here. And be honest enough to say, I've gone through this process halfway through, I'm like, ah, that was a bad idea, never mind. <laughs> and, and wait, here's another idea. Or, you know, uh, Susan, she had a good idea. What was your idea, Susan? Yeah, let's talk about that, because my idea is not working. But if you can come up with multiple 
of these, then you have some optionality. And the other thing that's beneficial about this is it kind of creates a culture of product managers and tech leads and really everyone that is problem focused instead of solution focused. So the solutions are ephemeral. You know, it doesn't really matter what the solution is. All that matters is you, though you pick the right one that's gonna have the biggest impact to start with. It doesn't matter if it's from me or from you or anybody. You know, it just matters that collectively we feel the most confident about this idea, that we can get behind it, not just for going to market and being successful, but for getting engineers motivated, right? People don't want to work on products that they don't believe in, bottom line. So you need to convince yourself, your company, everybody that this is the right way to go. And the only way to do that is just is going through the process of crystallizing your thoughts into, you know, organized, structured thinking. Any other questions on this? This is a lot on uh, B2C. Um, well, this is applicable to B2B C yeah. or B2B. There's no, I would, you know, uh, print to fire B2B to B to C. And you know, this is the kind of approach that we're looking at with them and, and working with them to do. I don't know if it's, in, how, and in what ways do you see it as? Customer discovery, how would you do B2, for B2B? Then? Oh, it's much easier. Would you be directly calling them, or would you still run some ads just to get a buyer? Well, you, you, I think the tactics are different in, in like probably ads won't work, but why, the reason why B2B can be easier is because their audience is much smaller. Yeah. Your universe is tiny sometimes. Let's say that you have a solution for healthcare that you're going to sell to insurance companies. How many large insurance companies are there in the United States? I don't know. I've never figured this out, but I'd say, I'd guess like 20. Right? So there's only 20 companies that you actually can even sell to. So that's, that's easy to target. You could do retargeting ads that just target on Facebook, you know, uh, do a survey, get a, a Starbucks voucher or something, and it's very easy to target them. So I find that much easier than consumers. Because then that's one of the reasons with consumer stuff, it's so important to be focused. And then it's like, well, how do we find these people that meet this criteria? And that can be hard sometimes. It's like, gosh, I don't really know, you know. Some of the time it's easier and sometimes it's more difficult, but it can be, it can be more challenging in my experience. Does that make sense or? Cool. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is just kind of a, a visualization of, all right, you got, you got a few ideas, solutions. Um, you know, this is about exploration and discovery, lots of group discussions, collaborative refinement. You're just really kind of developing these ideas collaboratively collaboratively um, and like I said before if the engineers are really motivated and everybody is marketing is like yeah we can do this and we can do that and the energy of the room is just like electrifying that's a pretty good indicator that you're probably on the right path because the thing that you need to do any of this is excited motivated teams right you can't you can't build an awesome product with with apathetic engineers and product managers and product designers who just like, eh, I guess, you know, a accounting ledger is cool. Um, no, that doesn't, you know, they're not going to be excited about that at all. So once you get people on board and you feel like, yes, everyone's behind this, you do have to test. You do have to get some validation, right? We all think it's a great idea. Does the market. And that, that, that can be, in the B2B context, potential partners. Like, let's say you have an idea, but in order for that idea to really work, you need to do three distribution deals with three key players in that ecosystem. If you can't do those deals, the idea doesn't work at all. So it's dependent on that. If that's the case, what's the next step? Talk to those companies. See what they think. Are they like, we're building that ourselves? Or are they, hmm, that's pretty interesting. We'd be interested in talking to you more about that. That's more evidence that you're on the right track. On the consumer side, it's, you know, starting with you know, user testing uh, with prototypes and then moving into you know, eventually a small release and that targets the users you want to go after and seeing what the traction's like and getting the feedback and seeing if are we on the right track, is there demand for this, was our hypothesis correct or wasn't it? If it wasn't, you reject it. <laughs> you go back to the drawing board, right? This is a very simplified view of the scientific method that every scientist uses in every scientific field. You got a hypothesis, you test it with experiments, 
And based on the outcomes of those experiments, you either make changes and iterate on it, or you start over again, or you go to the next phase. And the next phase in product development is often the feature brief or the PRD, the product requirements document. And that is the solution hypothesis that's far more expanded than what you did in an ideation, right? Ideation is just a, whoopsie, did I break it? Oh, there we go. Ideation is, is, is really an exploration. A feature brief or a PRD is the canonical document that defines exactly what the solution is going to be. It's got to have the user journey. It's got to talk about the risk factors. It's got to talk about the competition. It's got to articulate why this is the best solution out there. It's got to articulate what the other solutions are and why they're not the best. It's got to talk about exactly who this user is. It's got to talk about how much engineering time is this going to take. It's got to talk about what the user stories are. Um, what are the uh, unit economics of this? How much is it going to cost us to develop this? How much servers? You know, uh, CPU cycles do we need to process this stuff? Um, it's got to, it's everything, really. And it starts out fairly simple and grows in complexity as the product evolves. So a key thing in making this work, I talked about a little bit earlier, is to focus on problems and not the solutions. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for this, but, you know, three that really kind of stand out to me is that, um, if you grow attached to the problem rather than specific solutions, you're always open to a better way to do things, right? You're always open to evolving what you've already done or, or, or trying a different approach. If you, grow it to, if you start it from a solution perspective, you're just immediately attached to that solution. Um, it allows product managers to assess all these potential solutions with total objectivity. If you create a culture where, where you're like, Let's focus on the problems and not the solutions. And it's okay if we're wrong on the solutions. Don't grow attached to them. You will, you know, you're not a bad PM if you come up with a solution that doesn't work. You're a, you're a bad PM if you come up with a solution that doesn't work and you refuse to admit it. And you're, you don't acknowledge it. And you don't make the changes necessary. Um, and it stimulates innovative thinking, as I talked about before. Because if you're framing the problem and not the solution, that opens up your creative brain to come up with ways to solve it. I'll give one example. So, I was working for a company and I had just started and they had a roadmap and I looked up at the roadmap and one of the items was gamification. Like, let's, we're gonna create gamification in the app. And the first thing I asked was, why? And the answer was, oh, because we wanna have more engagement. We want it to be stickier. Okay, so why are you going right to gamification is the answer. How do you know that answer? How do you know that that's the only way to engage users? Sure, it might be gamification, but it could be a host of other things, right? So by putting gamification on the board, the entire company stops thinking about the problem. It's solved. Gamification is the answer. But you, haven't, you don't know that. And then you've got the CEO walking down the hall saying, hey, how's the gamification thing going? And you're like, fuck, I don't know. It even works, right? So you're stuck. You're just stuck there. Your, your investors, everyone's going to be asking for this thing that you thought was the answer, and it may not be the right answer. Scientific method in more detail. I'm not going to go through it. You guys will get the deck afterwards. All right, defining an MVP. This is super key. So um, we know what value we want to deliver, right? That's the why. We think we know the solution. That's the what. Now we need to get really specific about exactly what value we're going to deliver and what we can do as quickly as possible, right? And that's the how. That, is, that constitutes what we're going to take to market first. And this is, this is, a, this is difficult to do, to define to, to what, what can we not do. And going back earlier to what Steve Jobs said, it's more about what we're not going to do than what we are going to do, right? At the same time, per someone's really good question earlier, you gotta be really disciplined about what viable is. Because so often, because Agile Scrum, the lean startup, that whole kind of ethos is so rampant, in many ways the pendulum has swung too far in that direction. And there's a lack of discipline around really understanding what viable means, right? So I've seen a lot of products, I've been involved in a lot of products where we think it's viable, but it just isn't. There was one thing that we should have done that would have made it viable, but we didn't because 
we thought that we didn't need it, but we should have known that had we done our homework in the previous phases here. We would have known that. Um, as I said, you know, it's saying no to all these great ideas and then having evidence to back up why you're going to build these features first and why you have confidence that they're going to move the needle the most. So, you know, it's one thing when you're a scrappy startup with five people. It's another thing when you've got to prove to your boss and this thing's going to cost a lot of money to build that this is going to work. You have to have evidence, you know, empirical evidence as much as possible. It's not perfect. You could be wrong still, but it's about increasing your confidence that you're right. Um, understanding, whoops, spelling error there, sorry. Understand your development capacity. You know, how much can you get done in a certain amount of time? Well, what is your, you know, what is your capacity of engineering hours, of product design hours, et cetera? Using some method like rice scoring or um, priority poker, there's so many different methodologies out there to create a relative priority ranking of these various initiatives that you want to do. It's okay to have a list of a thousand things just as long as no one else sees that list and that you keep it very, very tight um, to only those things that are going to, that are the most important things to understand about this product out of the gate. The goal of an MVP is not to create the best product in the world. The goal of the MVP is to gather more information, more evidence. Yeah, we're on the track, right track. Hmm, this isn't working like we thought we would, so we're gonna change this. It's just about iteration. So, by doing an MVP, you can get out the door quickly and then you can do two week sprints, right? You're shipping either every day, every week, every two weeks, constantly putting out improvements, constantly getting feedback, and then it's a moving train towards product market fit. Rice scoring, this is how it works. This is the method I use. It's a really easy way to rank order, prioritize various competing potential features. And the way it works is um, you think about the reach. You know, how many users will be impacted by this? Is it everyone or is it just a small segment? Is this an edge case or a really common case? The impact per user multiplier. So, and this is a, this is a kind of subjective thing, but it should be consistent in the way that you use it. So you just create a multiplier of impact. Like this feature is going to have a huge impact in solving this problem for this user or just a little bit of an impact. Confidence, this is probably the most important variable here. It's basically saying, of all these other estimates, how confident are we that they're correct? Um, and then there's effort. You know, how, many, how, how long is this going to take to build? Uh, it is usually person weeks, engineering weeks, et cetera. The reason why confidence is so useful, at least to me, is because without that, it's super subjective, right? You're saying, I think it's going to reach this many people. I think it's going to have this impact and I think the effort's gonna be this. Now, all things being equal, it's very different to do rice scoring when you've done a ton of user research, done a ton of usability tests, have created prototypes, have talked to potential customers, have talked to potential partners. Your confidence is gonna be much higher because you've done that work. When the confidence quotient is higher, the score is higher. Rank order everything by its rice score and you're gonna get a pretty good, at least initial list of what to do and when to do it, right? Does that make sense? Feature brief. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. To me, this is, you know, once you're, once you're in the process of actually really defining and designing this product, um, this is when it all really starts coming together. I see it as a prerequisite to, um, actually building the product, right? So oftentimes what I will do with product, my product teams is we have weekly product reviews and in the weekly product reviews, we review product briefs. Uh, PMs send the brief out 24 hours before the meeting. Everyone is required to read it. If you didn't read it, you can't come to the meeting <laughs> because it's just waste of your, you know, I don't want to hear someone's opinion who hasn't read the brief. That's, that's, that's silly, right? So everyone reads it, you get together, and you ask really tough questions about the research and the viability of the data that we're getting and make a determination as to should we build this or not? You know, should we build this feature? Should we build this product? Should we go after this vertical? Whatever. Um, it articulates a problem and pro proposed solution in a way that anyone can understand. That's super key. You know, because if you're in the tech 
if you're in a tech company and you work in the tech team as an engineer, product manager, a data scientist, whatever, you're probably speaking a language that most of the rest of the company doesn't understand, right? It's, and that's not good. You know, it, you need, to, especially a PM, your job is, is cross-functional. You need to connect with marketing. You need to connect with sales. They need to be on board with what you're building. You know, marketing needs to believe in what you're doing just as much as your engineers do. And so you need to be able to articulate what you're building in a way that they can understand, not just engineers. So you know, one of the things that I do is have people write a user journey where they actually write a story. Like Katie's walking down the street and her phone notification goes off. She opens it up and it says that one of her favorite stores is right there and they're having a sale and she goes in there and does this and that. Just writing a story, like thinking it through from that perspective. And then when like, someone in PR reads it, they get what you're, we're building. They understand it on a personal level, right? That's super important. Um, determines the viability by testing assumptions prior to writing production code. That's really, really important. It's super expensive, right, in terms of resources to put a bunch of engineers on a project. It's, and it's irresponsible to do that unless you're pretty darn sure that what they're going to build is, has vi is viable. Um, it becomes a canonical source of truth for the product, right? This is the thing that everybody can reference to get an up-to-date understanding of what's going on. And as I said before, it's the exit criteria for entering the design phase, and that can be technical or visual. Does that make sense? Would you do any shortcuts? Yes. You mean in terms of the feature brief? Everything up to this point. For the sake of yeah, how much I, time we need to uh, that's, that's dangerous, right? Yeah. So, um, no, what I would say is we need to cut these features because we don't have enough time. It's not, we're not going to do the work, we're just going to limit the scope. That's a much better option than cutting corners. And th this is a very lightweight thing, you know, and it can be even lighter. So what we just looked at before the, the feature brief, it depends what you're building drives a lot of how much work you put into it. If this is a brand new product, or this is your entire company, like this is the, the product, it's gotta be, you've gotta feel, at least I do, I need to feel confident that this is the right thing. And the only way to do that is to do that work. You know, the, the idea, you know, a lot of us think about like, oh yeah, you know, Mark Zuckerberg just thought of Facebook in his dorm room, and that's awesome, and, and we have all these anecdotes. But the reality is those are, those are like one in a zillion lucky, throws, right? For most of us who do this, you know, for 30 years, most of those throws don't stick, you know, and then you very quickly learn that, ugh, you know, for, to increase the probability that what we're about to, like, <laughs> chew glass about for the next three years, doing a startup is not easy, as you guys all know, you know, it's whatever we can do to increase the probability that this is going to be successful for us is worth doing, I would say. Um, you know, having said that, all of this stuff here is really just a blueprint. And every time I work at a new company or with a new team, it all changes a little bit. You have to be agile and open to change and doing things differently. This is not the only way to do this stuff. And this isn't even, I don't even know if it's the right way to do this stuff. This is just the way I've been doing it and it's evolved over time. And every time I have a new job or something, I come out of that doing things a little bit differently. A little bit better, I think. Or just differently, maybe. Maybe worse. I don't know. But the point is to be open to, you know, don't be a slave to the process, right? And come up with a process that works for you and your team and, and, and read a lot. Like, talk to other product managers. Read about how products were built. Read blog posts. You know, just gather information. And if you're passionate about what you do, which is building products, then uh, it should be kind of fun to learn this stuff and figure it out. Prototyping. So prototyping, I think, is super, super important, again, to, get, to, 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 to break this out into phases of getting further and further along to reaching product market fit and understanding that you're reaching product market fit. Um, so a prototype, it can be a simple paper prototypes. It can be mocks. It can have various degrees of fidelity. Um, the, the point of it is to get the product in front of people in a way that they can actually use as quickly as possible without writing any production code, right? You don't want to worry about scaling, you just want to get something out there and start getting information as quickly as possible. 
a lot of companies skip this step, right? Because it's like, oh, we figured it out, now let's start. The engineers are chomping at the bit, let's go, let's go, let's go. But if you do this, it's gonna, it's kind of, this is your last chance to get some real honest data inputs, qualitative and quantitative, about what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Is the UI gonna work, right? Do people, are they gonna understand the design patterns that you came up with? Why not do a prototype and some user testing to get the answers to those questions before you ship your product? And everyone's like, I don't understand how to use it. And then you're scrambling to fix it, right? That, you don't wanna do that. That's bad. All right, so I've got a prototype. Now it's time to actually ship it. So product launch. Assuming that you've received value, valuable feedback in all of these various stages, prototype testing being the last one of them, and you're pretty confident this MVP will work, you got to build a product. So one thing that people do that I think works well is to do a pre-release access of the product to a fairly small group of people and get their feedback as well, right? You went from prototype, now you've actually got something in production. When you've got something in production, all kinds of neat things happen. Performance issues, latency issues, right? Oh, concurrency issues, database lockups, state issues, you know, uh, things break and it doesn't work as expected and users don't behave as expected under those real world conditions. So if you can do that with a small group of people, get that feedback and fix it before you go big, again, it increases your probability of success, right? And then you just keep iterating with this group of users. And in B2B, this is really easy, right? Because you can go to a company and say, hey, we've got this product. We think it's going to solve a major problem for you. We're going to let you use it for free if you'll be part of our beta group and give us feedback. And it's pretty easy to get people to do that, right? They'll use things for free that say they're going to make their lives easier, right? The last thing uh, in this kind of product market fit, go to market strategy is um, I think super important that, that we often overlook is to really test the impact really, really carefully about how's this MVP doing. Um, you know, you've, think about it. You've, let's say you've worked for like six months or longer and you're finally launching the product and you're just so excited finally out there, a lot of times it's hard to then let 30, you know, have it out there for a while and then do really brutally honest feedback about how it's doing, right? Really objective scientific analysis. How is the product doing? What is it doing that we thought it was going to do? What is it not doing that we thought it was going to do? Where, what were we right about? What were we wrong about? And I think the best PMs I've ever worked with when you read their impact analysis report, it doesn't seem like it was written by the person who like, bought this product to market. It looks like it was written by a third party analyst, right? Completely objective, completely truthful, and uh, so important because once you get this information, then you've got some real data to iterate and drive probably you know, the next at least quarter of your roadmap is gonna be based on the findings in just a 30-day impact analysis. And it can make a huge difference in going from, mm, this is, has a little bit of traction to, wow, this thing's a like hockey stick taking off. How you do this and how you respond to the results, make or break it. So in summary, and then I'm done, we can, personas, who's your user? What are their needs? What's the value proposition you're gonna deliver to them that no one else is doing as well as you? validating that hypothesis, launching the product, analyzing how it's doing, and then iterating. And then you just keep doing this. This is what we do over and over and over again, and trying to make it better and better, broader adoption, et cetera. So that's it, thanks. Yes, uh, it's not on my, not my pocket, but I definitely have them, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, yeah. What are the best qualities of one, or what would it look like? You know, this is, this is one of those things where, unlike a, a feature brief or, or PRD, where it's good to have really uh, um, kind of standard things that you want, ideation documents are pretty free-flowing, because it simply is, how do I express this idea I have? 
and then you get feedback, you know, using Google Docs, bring in your, once you, it's like, ah, oh, I'm feeling, hey, what do you think about this? Can you read this? Can you comment what you think? And they say, oh, I didn't think about that. You know, for me, it's, these things tend to be a very collaborative, you know, and that's your first, that's kind of the first uh, test of, is this a viable idea? If you send this to your colleagues at, at work and they're like, nah, nah, dude, that's not a very good idea. Okay, sorry, uh, I didn't really send that to you. Here's another one, right? But if they're like, oh yeah, that's, that's interesting. Have you thought about this, this, or that? It starts to kind of take on a life of its own. Please. Uh, What's that? Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, does it make sense to do the stuff you have uh, presented today on an established product? Like yes. So um, not all of it, right? And, and I think to varying degrees of fidelity. But, but if you have established a product discipline that includes those key steps, even if you're not, you know, and, and the degree to which you do them can vary. You know, yes, you can cut corners a bit, um, but if you're doing those steps, it's a pretty lean, quick process. I, oftentimes people see that kind of stuff like, oh my God, it's a process. It's not. It's like, here's an example. Um, oh, do we really need to do user testing? Right? Do we, we really need to like bring in a whole thing and take days to set up? I'm like, okay, go to, Starbucks, right? Here's $50, buy five $10 gift cards, find five people in there, give them the app, and watch them use it. it takes 20 minutes. You're gonna come out of that 20 minutes with, you know, some really, potentially some clear answers. Um, and that's really useful if you're looking for a kind of a binary answer to a question. Will people click this button? If you give it to every single person and 0% do it, you have an answer. No, they will not. If 100% do it, yes, they will. If 50% do it, you don't have an answer. 30 don't have, really have an answer. But if you have a large majority working one way or the other, that answers your question. So there's a lot of tactics that you can use to, to do this type of stuff really quickly in, and without much effort, frankly. And as you get it bigger, then you can bring in the UX researchers and the usability labs and all that kind of stuff. But you, you can do this stuff pretty scrappy to start with. Uh, going back to that validation rejection phase, yeah. so do you have some framework how you set actually the threshold? Because yes. obviously sometimes That's it great could question. be obvious, but from my experience, for example, you take your, I don't know, very narrowed audience that you think is the, the best fit, and from them, I don't know, 90% don't seem interested. Yep. I don't know, you have one pre-order and the rest are kind of interested, take no action. So right. you can question whether it's your sales skills or that one or two pre-orders doesn't represent the audience. And right, so. now, that's, a great, that's a great question and something I, I should have mentioned is um, in the feature brief, it was on that feature brief slide, but the most important aspect of that or at any phase is to, to define the success criteria for each experiment, for each phase. So an example would be, let's say you have, it's just a feature idea, right? And, and, and in, in kind of writing out your feature brief, you define success as a 5% increase in CTR, right? And you run some tests and you're not hitting 5%. Well, you need to figure out why. And if you can never get it there, then it's just probably not gonna work. And you, again, if you're super objective and you're not attached to the solution, it's no problem to say, okay, it's not working, let's move on. Um, but yeah, to, to, you need to establish what success looks like so that when you hit it, you know you've hit success or you know relatively how you're doing. Um, you know, we were talking about this the other day, uh, good, good PMs, you know, when I, when I walk into the office and I see, see like my, my product team working, if they have their dashboard open with, and they are measuring, and they've instrumented their feature in such a way and are, are gathering metrics, and they're running the analysis, and they're seeing in a, some form, visualization or tabular visualization, whatever, of how is it doing? And I'll say, how's it doing? It's at 4%, you know, getting there. I think we're gonna get there if we change this and that. Cool, go for it, change it. Come in the next day, it's at 8%. Awesome, we're on the right track, it's working, right? If there's no success criteria, there's no instrumentation, there's no analytics, how do you even know 
Is this working? And it, what's, what's astounding is that I'd say, you know, 60% or more of software companies do not do this. They literally just ship stuff and then go, yeah, it seems to be working. Let's build some more stuff instead of measuring it and optimizing what they've already built. And the worst thing that folks often do is they ship a feature and then they move on to another feature and they never thought about how to maintain or improve this feature that they just shipped. It's a compounding resourcing problem. Features are super expensive. That's the other reason why you want to keep your scope small, right? And you don't want to ship features that you're not pretty darn sure you're not going to have to unlaunch, right? Because if you ship something, especially in a B2B context, and users become accustomed to it, you, it's really hard to take it from them, even if it's not working for them, right? Because they don't like change. And they'll be like, wait, I did use that weird notepad thing that was really hard to find that no one else knows how to use. I like it, right? Why'd you take that from me? And you've, you've, you've kind of uh, hurt your trust. Or you're, you haven't done it as well establishing trust with that user as you would have had you been more disciplined in making sure that what you're delivering is actually what they need. It's going to work, right? Question. Throw it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I kind of really like that you ended this almost ended it with this impact mapping. Yeah. And I guess it's a bit of a cultural question because uh, so in the best case scenario, you're like, yes, we rocked it. You know, it's amazing. But probably in a more typical scenario, it's like, mm, we kind of uh, did Some things are working, some things aren't. Some things are, some things aren't. And um, so the question is, in your experience, having led multiple teams, how did you kind of create that culture of like, hey guys, we totally fucked up on our assumptions. You know, I mean, it, it starts with, you know, it starts with first principles, I think. I, th I think it starts with establishing what are our principles as a product organization. What are the things that we will and will not do? What are the things that we absolutely believe in? And how are we going to operate? And, um, and really stacking hands as a team on this. Like, this is, these are, this is how we do things. Like, we, we index to quality over speed, let's say. I'm just making that up. Maybe it's, we index the speed over quality, you know, but as long as everyone's aligned, then it, it really helps answer those questions that you often, those tough product questions where mm, uh, it's really hard to make a call. Well, you can go back to your first principles. And if one of them is always do what's right for the user, and then you look, think about it and go, well, I don't know if this is right for the user, then just don't do it, right? Because it's not, it's, it's just, it's, it's just not aligned with your core principles. And if one of those principles is we make data-informed decisions and we have humility and we're objective and um, we're willing to do what it takes to find the answer, but we don't proclaim to have the answers. If you create a culture like that, and also as, le as a leader, if you're managing PMs, if you, if, you know, when you're doing one-on-ones, when you're doing product reviews, if you berate somebody because their experiment didn't work, you're a terrible manager because you're basically creating a culture of fear. And that fear is, um, if, I, if my, my hypothesis isn't correct, I'm gonna get yelled at by my boss and I'm probably never gonna get promoted. Instead, if, if your response is, okay, well, great, what did we learn? Okay, cool, let's move on, you know? And it's, it, it's like, oh, you mean I'm not in trouble because this didn't work? Of course you're not in trouble, you know? This is how, this is the journey. This is how we figure it out. We have to just do this. Hey. I read your hypothesis. I thought it sounded good. I thought it would work too. It didn't work, that's okay. Move on to the next thing. If that's the culture, when you do an impact analysis and, it's, um, you know, and you're getting these things and you've created that culture, that PM is gonna know that when they present this data, if they do it extremely objectively, they're gonna be viewed by their colleagues and by their boss as doing, have done, having done a very good job in the impact analysis. If you come in and are trying to whitewash things or trying to kind of, you know, spin things a certain way, it's not going to fly in a good product organization. People are just going to be like, no. And if you've ever worked at a company like Google and you get in front of like a Larry Page and, you don't, and you're not able to back up your proclamations with hard facts, that's scary, you know? <laughs> so I think it's about, it's cultural, you know, it's establishing those principles, right? Yeah. Um you talked about engineering teams, and then you talked about PM. Yeah. Is PM as a function part of the engineering team, or and is PM like a one-man show? 
or is it a team? That's a great question. And who are the key people on that team? Yeah. So, um, and this, again, varies all over the place. But uh, the, 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 what I think works best is a, um, a type of operating model and team framework where at the, at the, even from the very top, like the chief product officer and the CTO are partners, right? So you've got, from the very top, you've got the product person and you've got the engineering person and they're, they're partnering to make all this stuff a reality, right? And then that cascades down to your team. And the team will have a PM lead and a tech lead, right? And they're partners. Getting engineers, in, and this is something that I learned the hard way. It's super critical to get engineers involved in this stuff as early as possible. Because you need your engineers to be on board with what you're building and excited about it and motivated. And you know, the great thing about working with engineers is they're blunt. <laughs> you know, they're going to tell you the truth and you're going to know right away if this is resonating or not with them. And, and you, need, you need that partnership to make it happen. So the way, you know, the, the, the model that I tend to use the most these days is, you know, you've got your leadership on top, let's just say it's a CPO and a CTO for sake of argument, and then you've got multiple teams, potentially. Let's say this is the, um, I don't know, in the case of your company, it's like the hardware. Right? And then you got your software. I'm just making this up. And then under each of these, this, there's a, there is at the director level or whatever kind of seniority level below this, these each have a, like a VP of engineering or a director of engineering and a PM director who oversee this team. Same with this. So you've got a, um, you know, PM director. You've got an eng director or an eng manager, director level. Same here. This is a team, say hardware, right? And you've got a squad that does. What's what's a squad uh, uh, in your in your company that uh, would focus on some aspect of hardware, like the microphone or? Okay, microphone. The mic squad. Same thing with this. This is going to be a team of maybe. Five, you know, five engineers, and maybe let's say um, industrial designer or two, like two designers, and then. But leading this is going to be a PM lead and a tech lead. And again, it's that partnership. These guys are partnered. These guys are partnered. These guys are partnered. These people, rather. You know what I mean? So, and the, the reason why this is so important to me is that. Um, like I said, it's just, it, it's you have to have engineers on your side, right? They've got to be part of this process. The other aspect that I didn't mention before is just they bring a ton of value to these discussions, right? Even the things that seem like they wouldn't be interested in, like personas and thinking, these are smart people, right? And, and getting as many smart people thinking about something is always going to be good, right? So, I, and, and the other thing is that they, they, they feel a sense of ownership, just like product managers do. They don't feel like a product manager is coming up to them and saying, build this where, fast. Where, where does like a user research come in? Yeah, UXR, so, or user research or UXR. So, I, uh, what's often the case these days is that's part of the product organization, so product management, uh, oftentimes product design and user experience research are part of that organization. And they often function as a guild or a, a unit that is not attached to any single squad. And if these are all squads, there's like, let's say, three under this team and three under this team. Oh, my handwriting's terrible. Um, they, like a user experience research, services multiple because they can kind of go from sprint to sprint or quarter to quarter based on what are the needs. Well, this team needs a ton of research on, you know, acoustic paneling or something like how that impacts, you know, sound and so forth. So a lot of research can be, needs to be done there. And the next quarter, they're going to work on something over here. And there's something over here. So it's, it's just kind of a, I don't know, a ephemeral, that's not the word, um, moves around. I don't know. That's how I would do it. 
it's easy question, I hope so. Here, I'm here. <laughs> Which feature you would like, I mean, product manager feature you would like to boost in yourself or maybe to gain? Say it one more time. Product manager feature or skill. Which one you feel like you want to boost, yeah, or maybe you can gain, maybe? All of them, all of them. <laughs> okay, which is most critical and most important? You have it in your slides, one value, so what is this one? So it, it depends where you are, I'd say. I'd say that the, the answer to that question really changes depending upon where you are in your career. So the way I see it is there's basically, there's kind of individual contributors, right, and people managers, right? And this is like, I don't, the terminology is going to be different everywhere, but let's assume that the, the, the ladders of a PM are associate PM, PM1, PM2, senior PM, director PM, VP, blah, 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 right? Somewhere along here, around director or senior PM, you move from being an IC to a manager, right? So. The skills that are necessary to really advance along up your career change over time. You accumulate these skills. So in the early stages, it's all about execution, learning how to do variant testing, learning how to communicate effectively with engineers, learning how to run a sprint planning meeting, learn how to run a retrospective meeting, learn how to put slides together for the CEO, for the board, it's a so what lot. is yours? What is yours? I'll now? get there. I'll get there in a second. <laughs> I'm not an IC anymore, right? So you're trying to do these skills. So for me, I mean, for me, I guess it would be getting better. So here you go. I see to people manager. When you become people manager, your world totally changes because instead of instead of uh, you know spending all of your time with engineers and getting stuff done, suddenly. You are, you are the manager of other PMs, right? So your job at that point is to become a coach, is to become a player coach, but a coach for the most part, and to provide them with air cover, right? Support them and what they do. You're, become a, a, you're of service to these guys, the ICs. That's what managers do. So again, you know, if I'm at this stage, what I'm, the skills I'm trying to develop are Coaching skills, communication skills. How do, I, how do I give constructive feedback that's going to help this person become better at this job? How do I convey the importance of doing uh, you know, user studies? How do I convey this stuff? How do I get people, how can I teach them so that they're gonna do their jobs better? That's still where I am. Like how can I, how can I continue to learn new stuff and continue to be effective in helping people to do their job? And I think that's, that's just never going to change because it's all, you're never, I mean, I never, I don't know about you guys, I never feel like I'm like good at any of this, right? It's like, I'm just a little bit, I suck a little bit less every day. That's the goal. Thank right? you. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, you mentioned that you like to involve engineers in the process as yeah. early as possible, but uh, how do you deal with those who, you know, they they just want to code. Like, yeah. they, don't, they don't want to sit in the meetings. They don't want to think about the, uh, of, of the product management that much, you know? Like, how do you deal with, with that? No, you're absolutely right. So um, there is a, what I find is that, and that's great, you know, and there's, you know, if an engineer just wants to code, and most do, frankly, then that's, that's fine. But, but making that available to them as an option solves a couple of problems. One, if they come back and say, ah, why am I building this stupid feature? I don't know. You didn't come to any of the meetings. Those are the decisions we made, right? So I don't know what to tell you, but maybe you should get involved in the decision-making process and you won't feel that way. That's a bit of an edge case, but it does happen. At least you gave them the opportunity to be involved. If they choose not to be, that's their business. In most cases though, you'll find that there are a few engineers that actually really like this stuff and want to be involved and they, they kind of self-select. You don't say it's mandatory that everyone come to this meeting or anything. You say, hey, you know, we're going to start thinking about this new idea. You talk about it in your like, weekly tech meeting or whatever. Hey, we're going to start exploring this idea. If anyone's interested, we're having a brainstorm out over lunch. Whoever shows up, that's probably going to be the team that's going to build that product. The, that very first meeting. 
It's, it's amazing. Like, I can tell you with absolute certainty, I remember specifically having those conversations and the people who showed up, who are interested enough to kind of talk about it, end up being the leaders of that product eventually. You know? um, and then those who aren't interested, that, that's fine. You know? Not everyone needs to be interested. Uh, so, yes, it has been a really great presentation. Thanks. Uh, really useful stuff. Uh, let's just give a big round of applause to Gannon. <laughs> and guys, if you like these events, feel free to share on social media. We appreciate them. Uh, and see you next time. Uh, and you can ask your questions. Are we going to share this out? Some, or yes, it, cool. it was live stream already. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Thank you guys. You didn't ask your question. Thanks a lot. It's all right. Very cool. Thanks. I have to say the doors of perception.